Okay, I think now is as good a time as ever. Um, so we still have people joining, but that's great. Um, and for all those who've made the time to join today, really appreciate it. Thanks a million for, for joining with us. Really excited today to just see the, the uptake and, and the number of registrations that came in over the last couple of weeks. Um, it's clear how highly regarded the principals in these schools we're speaking with now are, are valuing their staff um, and looking to support them in the, the phenomenal amount of change we've seen in the last um, six to nine months. Very excited today to have Paul Byrne, the Deputy Director of the NAPD with us today, and Andy Miller, the CEO of Phones Publishers. Um, so what I'll do is I'll quickly go into a very brief overview of what we're going to cover today, and we'll just dive straight in. No time like the present. So a very quick run through of the agenda. So I'll do a, a, a very quick welcome just to give you guys a lie of the land for, for who we are and why we're here today. Um, we'll then jump into Paul Byrne, who's going to discuss some of the challenges, impacts, and how to address the, the school and the school leader and the teacher burnout that uh, I'm sure many of you many of you guys are experiencing um, over the past six months or so. Um, then we'll move on to Andy Miller from Folands, and he's going to discuss the, the changing education landscape um, as seen from uh, their perspective and some really interesting insights from a research study they would have commissioned through Learnovate. And then I'll finish up at the end with a very quick demo um, and looking at how we're reducing the teacher workload uh, in at the same time as improving the feedback that the teachers are able to submit to students. So really excited to give you a very quick insight in terms of um, that. And uh, yes, yeah, so you can see the, the tools in action. We'll finish up then with a, a Q&A. So feel free to pop the questions in as we go out, go throughout the presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Porik and Mark from the Jumper Grade team are there and available to answer any questions. Um, and we'll, we'll line those up at the end as well for further follow on if you have any for specifically for us or any of the panelists um, as well at the end. So just before we go into Paul, um, I wanted to very quickly touch on uh, the Jumper Grade background. So we are into our fourth academic year since Jumper Grade started. And we have a kind of an interesting journey to whereby how we're working with schools today. So. When myself and Porik, uh, my co-founder, started Jumper Grades uh, over four years ago now, we looked at how we could support students outside of the class and making personalised feedback central to how we we're going to support them. And we very quickly realised that in doing so, there was a large group of students that came from families or backgrounds that didn't allow them to get the same supports that many students were lucky enough to be able to get when it came to, to private tuition or grinds as they're known. And that was a real, that became a real focus for us, that we didn't want to be part of the problem of, of widening the inequality gap, but actually there's a huge opportunity for us to have an impact on those students from those backgrounds. And that's, that's really formed a central part of what we've done. As we've grown over the last number of years, we've, see, we've always come back to how can we help reach those students that are the hardest to reach. And oftentimes that's really stood to us as we developed out our tools. So, Fast forward a number of years, we've then realized that as we've built it up over the number of years, there are lots of insights, learnings, and our platform has evolved to the point where there was massive overlap in the challenges teachers are facing in the classroom, that the jumper grade solution had, uh, had lots of uh, um, a really good fit for. So that's where the jumper grade platform has evolved, where we're now working with uh, schools across the country to make that personalized teaching experience available to more and more um, of their teachers to reduce the workload that they are being faced with in this new normal that we're in now at the moment. So what have we done to date? Um, some of the key things that have allowed us to, to um, grow at the rate we've done and work with more and more of the schools that we are. So first of all, we, were, we work very closely with our um, research partners. So we have built a framework. We commissioned a research project with Trinity College and Learnovate, the EdTech Research and Design, Design Center. Um, and that was building our first framework was around personalizing feedback in an online environment. And then having that research basis for the tool that we have built. We also work with the University of Limerick with the School of Education here. And we're running a PhD on, on analyzing the learning outcomes of or the students we work with as well. So um, both of those have been central to what we've done to date. How have we then made it simple for schools and teachers to use it? Always coming back to the fact that the, we integrate seamlessly with Google Classrooms, Microsoft Teams, and VSware in terms of getting the, the initial onboarding setup done as well. So this is key in terms of the level of work that schools, principals, and leaders have put into getting staff and teachers trained up in the existing tools to handle that, um, that complete upturn that we had six to, uh, six to nine months ago. Um, we're not looking to replace those tools. We're integrating with them to really reduce the workload and, and, and streamline those processes for the teachers. 
And the final side, and something we're very proud of, is the, the recognition we've had for the social impact in terms of those students we've been able to reach through the Social Entrepreneurs Ireland Award winners and the Rethink Ireland Award winners. Um, it's really something we're very proud of that this is uh, something, a solution that we're looking to help address and, and be able to help all students fulfill their potential and, and not just work with the exclusive few that are very lucky to do so. So that's a very quick whirlwind tour. Um, then summarizing what the Jump Grade platform is, it's the first personalized feedback platform for teachers. So I, I mentioned here that our aim is to support every teacher learning to provide a personalized teaching experience to their students. And starting off with, with the frameworks we've built um, from a research perspective, that's around the areas of delivering personalized feedback um, to students on an online setting. We see huge scope for other frameworks to be uh, in, uh, becoming part of the Jump Brigade platform as we evolve. And a massive opportunity with that is in the um, motivating, engaging and building students' confidence. So we'll touch a bit more on the confidence as part of the workflow at the moment. But if you think of the motivation, being able to, for a teacher to be able to understand the, the needs, be able to understand the interests of a student and tailor the, the academic support in that direction. So a very good example we, we often come across is think of a young guy in second or third year who's uh, maybe disengaged in the classroom or is going through some challenges at home. If we can have the interest to know that he's a huge Liverpool football club fan and that an English teacher is able to say, how about we channel an English um, assignment into writing a letter to Jurgen Klopp to thank him about for his work in winning the Champions League? or a math teacher is able to channel it in the direction of how will Liverpool Football Club spend their transfer budget. It's that insight into the individual that we're trying to build into a really easy to use way using lots of research back frameworks to enable those teachers to do something that wouldn't have been possible before without the technology. So without further ado, and I'll come back to actually show you how Jump Grid works um, in just a little while, but I want to hand it over to Paul Byrne uh, and he'll be able to do an overview from the insights received from the NAPD. Paul, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, like, I'm delighted to be here today to speak to you. <clears throat> I'm going to keep it short because I know that principals, deputies and teachers are very busy, but we're in a time of huge challenge for all of us. Um, since the lockdown, if you move on to the next slide, uh, David. Thank you. What happened? Well, we went from leading physical schools to digital schools overnight. And that was a huge change. <clears throat> Our communications from meeting the students in the corridors, from meeting the teachers, um, having to chat face to face, you can tell an awful lot by body language when you're speaking to someone. We went to virtual communications and it meant that we had to, I suppose, upgrade our communication systems within the schools very, very quickly. For teachers to have, and students, they had to move to virtual classes, which came on us, as I said, overnight, how to plan for virtual classes. We hadn't really, I suppose, thought far enough ahead on that, but people had to adapt to it quickly in relation to meetings, staff meetings, um, <clears throat> meetings with parents, communicating with parents as a group, we had to move to virtual meetings, which meant we had to decide and implement digital platforms. From March onwards, it became clear that we were in this for a longer term. And we had to look at how we were going to effectively continue education when the students and teachers were at home. The DES also recognized this and they set up um, a communications group is what it was called. And that was really to bring the education stakeholders together to get feedback on how things were working on the ground, to see what supports needed to be put in place, what was working and where difficulties were. Now, that group was made up of uh, ourselves, the management bodies and the teachers union and the various heads of different sections of the department. Now, very early on, NAPD put out a survey into the field to see the level of engagement in relation to digital devices and broadband. And we got results from 200 schools. And I suppose that's one of the things that um, came up very quickly. There was 3000 students who didn't have access to a digital device and three and a half thousand who didn't have access to broadband. And we put in as much, I suppose, support as we could to try and overcome some of those issues and that schools gave out devices that they had to students who didn't have it. 
the issue of broadband wasn't so easy to deal with. And um, we would have also had feedback to say that some students um, were having difficulty in paying for broadband at home. So we did a bit of work in the background to see what we could do with broadband providers to get um, <clears throat> better access at a better price for the students. In the midst of all that, then we had the whole crisis of the leave insert and when it was adapted to calculated grades. All of this is putting stress on principals, deputies, students, teachers, parents. But we overcame that. And then we started to look at the return to school and the preparations. On top of the return to schools, we also had at the end of the calculated grades, the issue coming up of the students who were still going to do the leave insert exams. Um, sorry, Mark or David, could you move that on? So <clears throat> in the midst of all that, the well-being of all of us was impacted because change is always stressful. Now, I know that for talking to principals and deputies throughout the summer, because they were working through the summer, the stress levels were extremely high. The stress levels for teachers and for students in adapting to online engagement was huge. One of the big issues that was coming back to us was the fact that um, teachers were getting concerned that some students weren't engaging as much as they should. We also had the issue of how do you manage a digital timetable? Uh, at first, we tried to roll out our normal timetable uh, with 32 periods if you're using 40 minute classes, but that doesn't work. It doesn't translate into a digital format. And we had to look at what sort of a suitable timetable would work. The planning of online lessons, uh, supports were put in by the PDST, the JCT and jump grade. And more work needs to be done there. Because if you're having difficulty in the planning and developing lessons, it adds to the stress of delivery. Given meaningful feedback, now I'm well aware of the amount of time that it takes to construct, I suppose, meaningful feedback. I have a daughter who's teaching and I see her um, as she's correcting online, the amount of time it takes for to get through the, the different work. And I'm delighted to see that the PDST, JCT and Jump Grade are putting forward good workable solutions, which will reduce the stress and reduce the workload there. The return to schools, the recognition uh, and reconfiguration of the safety protocols, positive, there was a huge amount of work in that. It was all put in there so that we could create a safe environment. And the idea of the safe environment was to ease anxiety. People were afraid going back to work. Students were afraid, teachers were afraid, staff was, were afraid. And the only thing that we had to combat that fear was to have the schools set up as safely as possible. We also have the issue of catering for the very high risk students and teachers. Now, I was very impressed with some of the work that had been done by Jumper Grade and how it could be applied in schools in helping to support the very high risk students and also to help teachers in the very high risk category who may be working with students who are, are at home. Um, for school leaders, the shortage of substitute teachers, we knew that that was going to be an issue and it is an issue as we run the schools at the moment. Um, also the shortage of teachers for home tuition, that's not something that's new. We have always had a problem in getting a range of teachers to engage with students who are at home for either medical or, or different reasons. I think Jump Grade has huge potential in helping us as school leaders there. And we all have to improve the level of communica online communications needed. So we have a lot done. How to sustain the quality of teaching and learning during COVID. Students, they won't have to be taught how to engage with online um, lessons. The teachers are going to need CPD in developing online lessons. And if they're confident and competent, it'll reduce the stress. Curriculum departments need to work together to reduce the workload under planning and plan as a team. Schools 
and ourselves are going to try and develop a digital contingency timetable, a plan B that if the school does have to close for two weeks, that you can just take this off the shelf, if you like, and apply it for the time that's needed. We need effective online feedback tools. And I know the PDSD and Jumper Grade have the, some fine resources developed there. And um, an effective tool for reporting to parents is needed. And again, that's something I know has been worked on in several areas. Just looking at the two timetables below, sorry. The regular timetable, 32 periods given 28 hours. That's not sustainable for students to engage with at home. And we need to look at other, I suppose, alternatives. Uh, if you move on. So <clears throat> how to address the burnout in a digital environment. Um, move on again. We need to continue to provide a safe working environment. Students need to be taught how to engage online. We need to do all that we can to cater for teachers um, in the area of digital CPD. We need to help the curriculum planning in departments to become a team activity. If you spread the load, it'll make things easier. We do need to have a plan B, a digital timetable that we can draw on when needed. And we need to adopt effective online feedback and reporting technologies. Look, the way it is at the moment, people can't work any harder. But what we can do is we can try to work smarter and we can try to use technologies that are there, which will make things more efficient, more effective. And if we are doing that, hopefully we'll be reducing stress and keeping some people away from what could turn into burnout. Thank you. Excellent stuff. Thanks a million, Paul. That's a really, really interesting stuff to hear. I, I think um, one of the things that jumped out to me, um, just as, as from the, the conversations we were having with teachers, um, is the exact same stuff you just touched on, even in your experience with your with your own daughter, that the, the level of workload that um, teachers are, are going through at the moment um, is so huge that it, it's almost like we, in response to COVID first, there was a lot of teachers going above and beyond, but it's just not sustainable to expect teachers to be able to maintain that. And, and from the stories you're hearing, we're, we're hearing of, of teachers working 14 hour days in order to be able to deliver to students in this, this blended of in, in school and online. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head there is that there's, there's, we can't work any harder. There's ways that we can work smarter. And that's exactly where we'd like to sit. And I think the longer term play then as well is seeing how CPD can become a part of that transition as well, that, that teachers are recognized for the work and the training that, that they're doing in getting to this stage. And that's certainly that's a key part of where we see the jump grade support being uh, in line with the, the CPD for teachers as well. Um, so what I'm gonna quickly do just before we, we um, jump into um, Andy's piece is I'm gonna run a quick poll. Um, so just to get an idea of some questions that uh, very quickly, just three quick questions that you can, teachers can, or uh, attendees here can, um, pop their answers into um, as you see it pop up on your screen now um, and just a quick reminder as well the chat window is available and the team are there if you want to have any questions or as things go on um, feel free to pop in so these questions by the way are anonymized um, we, we, it's not like you'll be um, on show for who said what it's just to get a kind of an idea of, of where you guys are at and, and where um, people are thinking at the moment and it's just interesting to see um, that yeah, across the board, um, it seems to be very common that teacher burnout is an issue, as we can see that flying up in the 90% plus. Um, so I'm sure, hence that's part of the reason why you, you um, most of you all are here today. And um, the second question then is looking at um, uh, the different kind of stages of, of um, working with feedback that schools are at, which is really interesting. So from some have a school-wide approach that all teachers have adopted, Others are very early in that stage and, and are looking for help in that. And that's that's a common theme we see. I suppose it's, it's a challenge with the, with the range of kind of um, technical capacity that different teachers have is that you have some very technically minded teachers who are pushing the boundaries and you have others who are at the op opposite end of the spectrum and may feel a bit overwhelmed or even isolated because they're not the ones who are um, as tech savvy. And that's that's a very interesting use case that we'll, we'll talk about later as well as about um, creating that entry point for teachers of, um, of all levels of ability when it comes to technology. And the last one, I think it's really important then from what um, Paul would have reiterated was 
uh, your own well-being as principals and deputy principals that um, like working through the summer um, like midterms I was talking to a, a principal yesterday where they were sourcing uh, a marquee during the midterm to try and have uh, students be able to have their lunch outside during the winter months like they, this the, the these unforeseen circumstances have just added to, to the workload you're seeing and, and um, that can only be coming back through to the teachers that um, are working with you as well so um, yeah, thanks for the, the um, feedback there and those on that poll. Um, I'll end that now. And um, what I'll do is I will hand over to Andy Miller next. So Andy, um, I will just get your slides up now. If you give me two seconds and I will hand the baton over to you for want of a better word. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'll just let you get into presentation mode. There you are. Is that displaying okay for you now, Andy? No, not in presentation mode at the moment. We're just still in uh, slide view. Okay, two seconds now. Yeah, is that okay? Great, yeah, and uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And you can skip through, Dave, to the uh, third slide, thanks. Um, so uh, effectively, uh, why you might ask, uh, am I attending the, the event today? Well, it's. It, it, it's a great honour to be here uh, and thanks Paul and Dave for, for both asking me to, to, to come along um, and the team at Jumper Grade. It, our role, and, and we are no different to everybody else, our, we, have, we have a role to play as, as one of Ireland's leading publishers, education publishers, in what can we do to support our customers who are teachers uh, and schools? How do we support best uh, you guys in, in, in how you deliver content? Um, our role uh, as a content provider, whether it's in physical textbook or in digital content, is to be able to understand and adapt how things are happening in the marketplace. And certainly COVID-19 has been a, a massive learning uh, for everybody in this sector. So we, we carried out a bit of research. So Dave, if you just click on there, we carried out research with Learnovate, um, who, as David said earlier on, are the uh, Education and Technology uh, Research Institute uh, uh, aligned to Trinity College. To, to survey both primary and post-primary schools following the outbreak of COVID, as well as teachers and parents as individuals. Um, and it was something that we were planning to do, but COVID had accelerated our interest in our research into this area. So um, as a respondents group, we got 700 teachers responding. I'm gonna focus on the, the, the post-primary uh, survey because I think that's most relevant for today. And really it was looking at what was the impact of digital learning in schools and in particular what has been changing results of COVID. So all I'm going to do today is talk a little bit around some of these results to see that they echo through to what you're seeing. It, it ties a lot into what Paul and David have said um, and our role working with Jumper Grade in terms of how, how we're assisting in terms of content. Um, we're also using this research to help us as we look at our own business and look at how we uh, change and alter our path to adapt to the changing needs of our marketplace. So what went well, what needs improvement and what does the future hold? Okay, so Dave, if you, if you just click on to the next uh, paragraph there and then the major insights. So a lot of what we got from this report back uh, was around how students were engaging, how, the, the, how teachers in particular were using the familiar tools that they had at very, very short notice to get them through this Hump to get them through the first lockdown uh, and to normalize learning for students as much as possible. And to also look to see, are these same tools, the tools that would be required moving forward, or is there new ways that we all as stakeholders in this industry can help support teachers and schools? And that's something that obviously that, that, that ourselves, Jumper Grade and a number of organizations are, are, are looking at. Um, it also came apparent as part of research is the teacher ingenuity to create resources uh, teachers are, if nothing, they are creative. Uh, and we all saw some of the, the extraordinary ways that your communities and yourselves uh, went about how to, to, to get things done during this, uh, this lockdown, not only in post-primary, but also in primary. Um, the, the, the thing from an education publisher is, um, side of things, and I, I am the chairperson of the, the association, the Irish Education Publishers Association, so I can, can speak on behalf of all of the publishers the decision that publishers made to open up the content uh, through the last lockdown was a very, very tough decision that publishers made, but it was the right decision to do. 
Um, it caused lots of challenges in lots of ways because we didn't expect the uptake to be as, as, uh, as, as big as it was, but that's a positive showing that that support, that those tools, that content that was made available was doing the right thing. So uh, I know that all of the individual publishers made their own decisions about that, but I think as an association, I think, I think that we tried to do our best to help everybody uh, to get through this, this last period. Um, and then looking forward, one of the other insights of this, of, of this report was, what is the impact looking forward? What are the do's, the don'ts, the imperatives? Um, and it has been, you know, Paul, you, you, you hit it, you know, very, very succinctly. If over 3,000 families didn't have access to devices, or students didn't have access to devices, and 3,500 families didn't have access to broadband, it isn't the same landscape. It isn't the same for everybody. It, not everything is equal. And, you know, during the last lockdown, it was in some ways frustrating hearing, you know, the, the, the media in some ways saying that, you know, technology is going to do everything. We're all going to run through technology when it's not a level playing pitch for everybody. And we all have to serve everybody's interests, no matter what their challenges are. OK, so David, if you can just uh, jump forward now, um, I'm just going to go through a number of slides, not in any detail, just to give you a snapshot of some of the findings that, that we have. Um, and the first one is uh, looking here around the um, the approach to digital devices has your school adopted. What was surprising in this one was that only 15% of those respondents out of the 700 uh, respondents said that their schools were device schools using one-to-one -one devices. And a surprisingly high number, 25%, uh, said that they were using BYOD. So you would expect uh, labs and trolleys to be the majority of 60% uh, and 50%. Uh, so it was quite interesting that, that device schools were um, quite low down in, 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 this, in this cohort. Uh, now, moving on then to the type of devices, and again, the type of devices that students were using in the main and the majority was mobile phone, which again, for post-primary, uh, was to be uh, expected. And while, you know, this is what the students are using, we asked in the further question then, David, if you go on further, from a, from a teacher perspective, what do you think works best for students? And the overwhelming majority felt that desktop was the most appropriate way for students to engage in the learning par part of their day, with tablets being very, very much seen as a secondary, but also very, very appropriate, all the way through to the high 90%. Um, and mobile phones, not so much. Okay, so it was very interesting to look at the device aspect of it. And then David, if you move forward then, um, we then looked at the, the tools, what were the digital tools that were helped uh, help teachers through this uh, this last lockdown, um, and what was clear here was that um, that we had in the strongly agree and agree that there was about fifty percent of respondents said that there was a positive in student improved in student engagement during this last period, and definitely a, a, an overwhelming piece that said that collaboration had increased with higher than fifty percent people saying strongly agree or agree. However. When we look at the impact of this, and it has been touched on already, and this, this smarter versus harder, the impact, the inverse impact for the teaching community as a result of having to flip into an online learning mode was massive. And that the impact for teachers and schools is diametrically opposite. So in, in getting people online, the workload had massively increased. And that's something that we all have to, to, have to take on board. And you know, while making assessment easier is in the balance, um, and you know, it, it's it's vital for us as a, as a stakeholder in the education system and a stakeholder to understand is how do we help? And that was one of the things we wanted to find out is what do we do as an organisation to help? So if we can move forward uh, to the next slide, please, David. And the challenges, the real challenges that were faced, and we all know um, from being in the classroom especially in, in, in the post-primary environment, if in the first few minutes there's a challenge with technology, there's a challenge with devices, the class can go into, in, into a very, very bad place. So the majority of, of, of teachers came back saying that getting students, supporting students in the classroom was the biggest challenge, closely followed by getting started, the basics. And also then something that ourselves, Jumper Grade, uh, need to consider is getting the content that I need into the tool. That's something very much that we have to be aware of, is how do we, when we're providing digital content, how do we, when we're providing tools to assist 
teachers, both in remote learning and in, uh, uh, in class, how do we provide the content in the best way to make it as effective during, during your teaching time? So if you scroll on. So in terms of then support, uh, some of the support challenges, uh, this was quite interesting. Uh, and it's probably not surprising for many people uh, in the day-to-day -day school life. The majority of people said, the majority of teachers responding to the survey say that they go to their colleagues, followed by school IT, and Dr. Google came in at 40%. So it is incredibly how much we rely on Google to help us when we have challenges. YouTube is another tool that was, was, was strongly looked at. But that just shows also that the, the lack of supports that are there in this new model that we all have to work out how we support the teachers in the classroom, the teachers at home, the teachers doing their job, the schools, the principals, the deputy principals, how do we all do that? It's all of our challenge. But when we looked at the other category, and thanks David for, for bringing it on, ironically enough, or interestingly enough, family members was the biggest cohort of the others. Um, so people relied on their family, people reached out and weren't afraid of reaching out. Um, and one interesting one is, I up till a few minutes ago, I've never heard of Smiggle. I thought it was a sister company of Riggle or some other derivation of it, but I've never heard of Smiggle, but that may re well be for lots of people to know about. Um, okay, so that support is huge. Um, but moving forward then, and again, what do you want to see using going forward? Vast majority uh, as lifesavers and very helpful ebooks. Again, part of our role as a, as a publisher, as a content provider, is to ensure that we provide content to help you guys. You're, you're telling us these things. But that on its own isn't enough. And you can see the number of uh, people on the right hand box, the number of respondents who put into, the, into those categories. The automatic marking of homework, the online recording of students and, and classes. 80% plus respondents there saying that this is what they wanted to have moving forward, which is exactly the path and the journey that we're all looking at in, in, in the context of today's webinar. So very, very timely and very, very apt in, in terms of what all of our roles are is to try and provide these tools for you. Um, and the majority of teachers that were polled here came back again, what are they using technology specifically for during the last lockdown, recording videos, lessons and presentations. Now imagine a world if those solutions already existed. Imagine a world if that content was available to help those solutions do the job, the platform to do this job. And that's what I think we're, the, 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 the proposition that the guys from Jump Brigade Grade are, are really here today to talk about is that, that whole area, the, how they solve these things, supporting with evidence that we have gathered ourselves. And finally, I think the last uh, uh, survey uh, from, from the thing that I'm going to share today is if I had 10 million funding, well, I think all of us individually uh, would hear a lot of music in our background. If we had 10 million funding, we would probably be doing something completely different. But in the context of uh, school, it is just frightening to see that the vast majority of these respondents, it was all about infrastructure. All of these ideas are wonderful. All of these um, goals that we all have, the Department of Education, it's all wonderful. But if the infrastructure and the support systems and the CPD has been spoken about, if they're not there, how on earth are any of us going to be able to do a, a new normal? How is any of us going to be able to work in this environment? Because it's great to give the sound bites and the media have been fantastic about the sound bites, about everything is wonderful now, it's all going this direction. But in absence of the supports, in absence of the infrastructure, and in absence of the right way to do it, I think it's going to be a real challenge. So to summarize, why did, why did we engage with the guys in, in Jumper Grade uh, on, this, on this project and this initiative? Well, certainly in, in both David and Porrick, uh, you know, how can you be that young and that clever and have all these great ideas and you know come to market with some something that's fantastic that that's a testament to your ambition it's a testament to how you guys are approaching the marketplace and that's about can-do attitude it's about looking to solve problems we first uh, came aware uh, of the of the guys through their social innovation uh, requirements and they asked us to support uh, them uh, through the Fulham's giving program on a nationwide 
uh, project and we were delighted to come on board. And that gave us a real flavor of, of what the guys can do. It is also complementary to where we as, a, as an organization, as a content provider, our vision is going. Um, the timelines of our research and some of the products that we're bringing to market over the next little while are very, very similar. So we, we were delighted to be able to offer our content in, in, in conjunction with, with what the guys in Jumbo Grade are doing to help develop this marketplace, to help put content in place. Because again, overwhelming was coming through the research. And again, with the, the guys and their team in, in, in Jumbo Grade, their ability to execute and seize this moment, you know, to go from where they've come to, to where they are, considering the challenges that they have, it's a testament to their ability, to their initiative. So it's a pleasure for us to be involved in this project uh, and to do our support roles. And I think that's really about it from, from a Fulham's perspective. So thank you for your time. I hope that was useful. Super stuff, Andy. That is um, uh, really, really good. I appreciate that. Um, some of the things that I, I jumped out at me, um, and it's almost, it, it tied together one of your earlier points um, to one of your later points as well, was the idea of with, with the move online, we saw huge increases in student engagement and, and, and more collaboration from teachers because because we know the teachers were, were going above and beyond. But what was also funny was how it, clearly there, there's burnout issues, but the the how teachers are using technology. So from recording videos and, and being able, what struck me was that it almost forced us to uh, think about how we we're reaching the students and, and reaching them on their level. But we had to do it in an unsustainable manner, manner in terms of, the, terms of the workload. So how do we now react to what we learned for the things that did go well, considering a circumstance that was very challenging, we learned a lot of good things. There's a lot of progressive insights we got from that period that it would be such a shame to think that they get put in a box in the corner and pushed away for years to come, that there is huge insights. The way we look at it is that we were bringing the learning to the students and not the other way around. And there's there's things that we can take away from that going forward. I think that that would just be a real a real shame to to leave behind um, uh, in in the past, considering all the work that has gone into it. So, um, yeah, that was Andy. That was excellent. Um, appreciate that. Um, so, guys, one of the things I'm going to move on to now uh, is to give you an insight into the Jump Grade platform. Um, so, let me just share my screen here again, and I can get this up for you. Um, so. Um, Again, it's, it's super to have both Paul and Andy's perspectives on, on, on how things have changed and, and what has worked and what hasn't um, over the last um, uh, number of months and almost a year. Where we've found our fit was that the overwhelming challenge was the teacher burnout that, that um, we were seeing teachers face. The, the idea of teachers being in school and then having hours of, of uninterrupted access from a student perspective to their teachers is an absolute recipe for burnout, exactly like you would have said, Paul, that it's an unsustainable um, level of engagement that we just can't continue. So it, it's about channeling those efforts in a way that make it more manageable again for teachers, but remembering the things that had worked out well. So teacher burnout is by far the, the number one thing that we look to address when we went about working with our schools. Now, the exciting part from our perspective is then is how can we blend that with creating a culture for high quality feedback so by standard standardizing that process by providing a research framework that works in a really simple to use manner for teachers we want to be able to unlock those feedback insights in a way that really reduces the workload on the teachers so i'm, I'm going to get into that and kind of talk about how the time saving the teachers end and can deliver a more uh, engaging feedback for the students so just to touch on some of the, the, the um, like our focus and, and the, the benefits that we've, we've seen and focused on. So first and foremost, it's about having that teacher workload when it comes to assignments and feedback. And, and I'll be able to show that in the use case of both Microsoft Teams and Google Classrooms, um, but specifically walking through the, the ease of use of the framework. Now, looking at what does an intervention like this, what does personalized feedback, the knock on effect it has on students um, in terms of their performance? So this is looking at over the past year and, and uh, the cohort of students we work with, there was an average grade improvement of 14.6% with 87% of those students reporting an increase in confidence. So there's no doubt of the impact of, of personalized feedback and, and the effects it can have in student performance and the students' uh, confidence levels as well, which is huge because you hear stories back from that of students sticking at higher level maths and, and what number of courses does that open them up for to, um, as they go on to finish their leaving search and, and apply for college courses. 
Um, so it, it's really seeing these results is why we get really excited about how we can um, support those teachers to deliver those, but always coming back to the fact that we're going to take the, the workload from them. Um, just before I actually go into the demo, um, we have we have um, the guys in the chat window would have popped in a, an opportunity to, to book a demo um, with the one to one demo for, for you and your school, whether um, yourself and a digital leader perhaps um, uh, want to join. Um, those slots are filling up pretty fast. I've seen the notifications flying in the bottom of my laptop here, um, which is great to see. Um, and just we're working towards our early adapter program that we're already working with the uh, cohort of schools, both from the um, WWETB. Uh, we have schools in Dublin and across the country as well, um, uh, particular cluster in, in the uh, Waterloo Wexford area as well, um, that are already on the early adapter program that we've worked closely with since the summer. Um, and they've been instrumental in terms of how it's shaped, um, how we're working now. For example, the, the Microsoft Teams integration was top of the agenda for them. And it was great to be able to visit those schools last week and, and give them an update on, on where that is now. Um, but also we have a limited number of spaces for that early adopter program. So we will have to, um, we expect that to be full by the end of next week. Um, but certainly those who are interested, we would encourage you to get in touch because um, yeah, we'd certainly like to, to fill that um, as, as quickly as we can. So one of the things they say never to do on a webinar is to run a live demo. So we're gonna run a live demo. <laughs> um, so just to give you an insight of, of the actual tool, I wanted to actually show it in practice. Um, I thought it'd be more useful for for you guys to see um, how it works. And one of the, the kind of key ways that I wanted to get that across as well was to, was to show the research framework in action. So what I'm gonna do here is I have a, a, a sample environment set up um, and, and walk you through the, from a perspective of what a teacher would see. But the key thing I suppose is, is getting across the idea of how a teacher can channel their efforts using the tool to actually focus on the common areas the students are falling down on, rather than having to do the very repetitive tasks within Microsoft Teams and Google Classrooms that we hear of often, is of copying and pasting and trying to reuse uh, comments and having to go into one student, copy it again and go into another student. So it's really about uh, reducing that workload, but channeling it in the direction of the common issues students are having. So our approach to that is by setting out learning goals at the point of creating the assignments. So whether it's learning goals or learning intentions, uh, the, the terminology used within your school, it is about setting out two to three learning goals for an assignment and channeling your feedback in the area of those particular learning goals. So this will become more apparent now as I walk through the tools. So I'm just going to um, dive in here and give an example of what that feedback um, may look like. So first and foremost, again, coming back to that ease of use for teachers, we've put a very simple starting input method of just using a slider for how correct the answer was and how well the students understood the goal. So you as a teacher will review the student's work uh, as they submit it, and you'll quickly say, okay, I need uh, this group of students are gonna get feedback on this particular learning goal. So whether it's 10 or 15 students, we're often hearing that, that there's common issues students have across the class, but it's still not efficient in terms of providing that feedback to the group of students that may have that issue. So this is where you selected your group of students that need help in that particular learning goal. You can slide it up here or you can lower it down based on how correct the answer was. Same in terms of their understanding of the goal. So did they grasp the, the understanding of that question? Were they able to show evidence of solving simultaneous equations or not? That's where you mark those students on that. So very low touch input method, but this is what pulls the recommendation engine on the next stage that you'll see of suggesting the right feedback for that group of students. Another very interesting data point that we collect as part of this is that when a student submit their work, they have to submit their level of confidence. So this is huge in terms of another, a new kind of point of, of interest for you as a teacher and for the teachers within your school as, as principals is to be able to see and have a record of a student's confidence level in particular topics as weeks and months go on throughout the year. So for example, here for this particular assignment, we can see the 42% of the class actually had low confidence in this area and you can go through the individual students. Those who are neutral or middle of the road and only 14% were highly confident in this particular learning goal. So we know now that, okay, this is an area that students were struggling on and this either needs more attention or needs something a bit more um, comprehensive in terms of just a, a, a type comment. So we're gonna walk through to the next stage and just to touch on this as well, that the importance of that confidence, this also feeds back into the, the student reflection on the, on the final end. So the way we look at it is trying to close the feedback loop and that there's a huge amount of work done in creating the assignments for the, teach, for the um, uh, students at the moment by teachers. The students are then submitting their work and then the work can be going into providing that feedback. But we don't know at the moment, is that feedback being taken on board? 
there's no student reflection that is reinforcing that the work the teachers have done are being uh, is being taken on board by the students. So it's about closing that loop where in a class traditionally we could look at them and do you get the nods or, or do you see the, the glazed look in their faces. It's very hard to replicate that digitally and we're looking to bring that that student reflection into the process so to really give new insights that teachers wouldn't have um, without it. So thinking again to, to my quite straightforward inputs with the sliders. What our recommendation engine, so the research framework that's working in the background here, is suggesting the comments that are most relevant to that particular group. So this takes into the, the sliders that you've used for the how correct the answer was, how the students understood the goal, but it also incorporates the confidence level of the class, of the group of students you've taken into as well. So you can see here, this, this will suggest um, how do the students do, how was their process, what are the next steps. These would be suggested based on what you've input on the previous page. Now, the thing is, as a teacher, uh, nobody knows the class better than, than the teacher themselves. So this is the scaffolding that allows them to provide the most effective feedback, but we're not telling them what to do. So for example, the teacher can add a comment here. So I'm just gonna add in, um, add my comments uh, to this particular um, uh, recommendation here. The teachers can choose from a different drop down on the template. So if they find there's actually, do you know what, this one is more fitting for my class than the one that was suggested. The teachers have, the power here to make the choice themselves. We're just trying to really streamline the process so that the level of feedback on the outside is of a higher quality, but the work required to put in in the first place is much, much lower. And then longer term, what really excites us about where this goes is that every time, what, what we're doing is we're anonymizing the data we're collecting from both the teacher and a student perspective, but we're getting huge insights across the board uh, um, for teachers across the country in terms of what are the key words, what are the phrases that are having a positive influence on student engagement and student confidence. So over time, all of the maths teachers who have an ordinary level third year maths class will be able to get prompts for, guess what? For this particular level of class, these keywords, these phrases are the ones that have the most positive influence on student engagement and student confidence. And it's those levels of insights where we're, we're, we're grasping everything that, that it's all the good work that teachers are putting in and then channeling it back to teachers so that you can benefit from the community that we're creating here um, of users within the platform. So that's something we're, we're really excited about. So just to come back to, to this very simple input methods, the teachers choose the ones that they see uh, most suit them. And now I'm going to talk about kind of what does that look like from a, from a, a practical perspective? So take, give me an example of what it looks like in, in a class setting. So what, I, what I'll talk through is, imagine we have a class of 30 students and the teacher has set out three particular maths questions that they want to go through. Maybe 15 students fell down on question two, but only five students fell down on question one. But actually there is a large cohort of students who fell down on question three. So the teacher is now able to go through and work on a solution based on the question one or question two, rather than having to tell each student with the typing out comments and all the workload that goes with trying to type mathematical equations. They are now able to record themselves or provide a solution that they've already prepared and direct it, it's almost like prescribing the feedback to those students that need the particular support that, that you're looking for. So just as an example, I'm going to show you where a teacher has actually included um, a recording of, of, um, uh, of themselves uh, working through a solution. So I'll just very quickly here and um, get this up to show when you channel your efforts for a teacher that in the case of a class of 30, you could record a solution to one of those questions, um, whether it's using a device or using um, other methods to do so to get across the, the, the students that fell down in that particular question and show them so they can see, they can hear the teacher um, walking them through the solution uh, uh, rather than just the, the type comment at the end on a, on a per student basis. And um, so that's just very quickly to get across where this tool can go in, in the terms of, of um, adding that, that level of feedback, that level of output from a teacher's perspective, but all the while coming back to saving their time. So that's what it looks like from, from a class perspective, channeling through the learning goals and providing the feedback in that manner. I'm gonna jump back in now to, um, the, um, to walk through, because one of the key things we always see is that, okay, we've put a lot of time, we've a lot of, invested a lot of time and effort and training from teacher's perspective into using Microsoft Teams and Google Classrooms. So I'd be very nervous as a principal of putting this in front of my teachers if I thought that they're gonna to have to change what they're already doing or try and relearn a new tool. And this is absolutely a common challenge that we see. So we are, we are from the very outset, we're integrating directly with Microsoft Teams and, and Google Classrooms. So this is not about replacing what you ought to have in place. It's about streamlining those workflows so that the teachers can now do something that's more efficient than the, what they currently do within those tools. So what you see here now is, is a, a common setup you might recognize in Microsoft Teams. I'll walk through another example for Google Classrooms in a moment. But what we'll do is we'll have a feedback tab here that lives within the Microsoft Teams environment. 
So you'll see now that some of the kind of the layout that you would recognize within the demo I just did will actually live within the Microsoft Teams environment. The teacher will never have to leave the platform. The students will never even know that the Jump Create platform exists. They'll simply receive a more streamlined and more, a, a higher level of, of feedback that the teacher is able to do without ever having to set up a new account. So that's kind of showing again within the Microsoft Teams setting, the same functionality that I would have just demoed is within that tool. And your output now is that, again, you, this is uh, familiar to some teachers and, and those using the Microsoft Teams system. It, it's almost indicative of what of Microsoft and, and Google can kind of, kind of the, the amount of weight that they put towards feedback in terms of its importance is that it has this tiny little box in the corner at the end of your assignment. What we're doing is we're pulling in all of our tool and the output that that gives and you're distributing it out to every single one of the students with the click of a button. So you've now prepared your class of 25 to 30 students as a teacher. You've done the, the feedback in terms of the two or three learning goals that you want to provide feedback on. And every student in the class, based on what you select them for, will get their bespoke feedback added with the comments that you have on a personal level if you want to do so, and then providing them the feedback for that particular area that they fell down on. So this is really about looking to build on what's already been done, but streamlining it to go that step further in terms of how can we raise the quality of the feedback while really reducing that workload and the repetitive tasks the teachers are running into and causing them to work these astronomical hours and the things that are just going to cause that, that uh, burnout as we, if we continue further in the line. Again, we'll look a quick look within the, the Google Classroom setting. So creating an assignment here. Um, again, it will redirect once the, the teacher has received a submission, it will redirect within to the, um, the feedback tool as you would have recognized within this quadratic equation. So I'll even go back one here. You can see that the quadratic equations um, assignment is, is automatically pulled in um, at the quadratic equations within uh, Google Classrooms. And again, that feedback being provided to the students on an individual basis across the class would automatically through the integration. So it's all about streamlining those existing workflows rather than replacing them. So some key takeaways, and I'm conscious of the time. Uh, hopefully the questions are still coming in. Uh, the Q&A is open and uh, feel free to pop the team a message as we go. But just some kind of key things that I want to, to leave with you guys. Um, again, just to, to mention that the opportunity to book a demo is available and we can certainly go into much more detail with um, yourself and your, your digital learning team or if there's a particular um, uh, staff member that you think would be the right person to join. Uh, we'd only love to talk to them. So um, feel free to click that link. But number one focus here is about reducing teacher workload. How can we focus on the learning goals while prescribing high quality feedback to each student? That is the absolute essence of what we're doing with the feedback tool here. Where we'll see that evolving is in using uh, further frameworks, like a motivational framework, like I mentioned earlier, and channeling that in the direction of the teacher, always coming back to something that is really easy to use. So this is the basis for what we've been doing so far. Second is ease of use and getting started. So with the VSware import through the, through, um, the system now, we can do simply do a, um, a class list export from VSware, um, add that in a, in a data protected and GDPR compliant manner through the platform ourselves. So there's no sharing of information via email or any other method. That's uploaded and the import script will then automatically set up every one of your teachers, your students and classes without any more than a click of a button. So there's no worries about adding students manually or, or trying to find out which member of a class are in or having login issues. That's all done from the start to get you set up as quickly as possible. And again, just to emphasize again, we're integrating, not replacing. There's massive work gone into the um, training of teachers when it comes to Microsoft Teams and Google Classrooms. We want to optimize those workflows and not replace the, the, all the effort that's gone into those. Okay, so coming towards the end, um, obviously I've mentioned there that we can, we'd can we really love to, to speak to yourself and others uh, within your school. Um, so feel free to book those um, demonstrations with the team uh, that, that they have been sharing them in the chat. What we do as a follow on is that we'd have yourself and, and a digital learning team or lead uh, within your school to join the session with us and to talk through um, the feasibility of how this could run and see whether there is space available still on the early adopter program. Um, which is currently, uh, we have capacity of 20 places and that's probably halfway full now at this stage based on uh, some of more meetings we had uh, earlier this week. Um, so it'll be likely by the end of next week that that could be full, but certainly don't be disheartened if that is full by the time you get there and we'll, we'll do our best to get your, your school up and running as quickly as possible as well. Um, Park and Mark are available to follow up um, and we'll be in touch with any of you have, who've reached out. Uh, and uh, what I'll finish up with is the opportunity to Direct those questions that have come in. Um, if there are any more for our panelists today, uh, I want to say a massive thanks again to Paul and, and Andy uh, for their insights and, and it's really great to have them involved. Uh, and for anyone else who does have questions, uh, please feel free to pop them in. Uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat here from the team. And um, 
Excellent. Yeah. So I see one has come in there. Um, I'll just uh, open up my chat bot here to make sure that they're coming in. Uh, and if the team, um, Park and Mark as well, are, are have any more questions, feel free to pop them in, and I can um, I'll be happy to, to answer those as well. Um, I'm going, Dave. I'm going to step in for one second as well. Perfect. I'm conscious that we were to do a draw. Um, so I'm Dave, one of uh, I'm part one of Dave's co-founders here at Jumpergrade. And um, we said we'd do a draw as well in regards to introducing um, one of the attendee schools as part of the early adopter program. And we had a draw going on here in the background and St. Francis's College, Rochestown have been selected as um, the school for um, the early adopter program as the winner of the draw itself. So we'll be following up directly with them um, after the session. Very good. Um, but yeah. Any questions, feel free to send them our way and um, really appreciate all, you, appreciate all your time. Uh, great great stuff, Paul, Andy, um, Dave, really enjoyed it. Excellent. Um, so I'm just checking the chat again. Uh, guys, if there are any things that, uh, that I'm missing, feel free to pop them in. Uh, I know the chat was active, but uh, there might be something that has gone above my head as, it, as we were going. The time frame of implementation. Great. So, so Mark just informed me here. There's a there's a question on the time frame of implementation. Um, very good question. So, what we've done to date um, with the early adopter schools is that um, so we started work with them quite early. But in the more recent schools that have come on board, we'll start with the demonstration. Um, we'll get you and your digital learning lead on as soon as possible to to run that demo for your school. See whether it is a good fit or not for the early, early adopter program from there, um, and the feasibility of turning around uh, within that shorter time frame. It also depends on whether your Microsoft Teams or Google Classroom school, uh, just in terms of that uh, integration with, with the tools that you, your school are using. But the workflow is very straightforward once the time of being accepted onto the program. So from um, uh, working with you guys in terms of the import of the VSware data, very straightforward, that sets up. And what we do is work with the subset of teachers to start off. So what are the eight to 10 teachers who would be a good fit to um, be the early users of the platform? From there, then we'd look for a whole school rollout. So. Um, yeah, time frame wise, the, the, depending on the eagerness of, of yourself and your teachers, um, we can move very fast, but we just want to do set expectations in terms of the availability and, and the number of spaces on that early adopter program uh, is subject to change. So I uh, wouldn't like to, to disappoint. Um, I can see another question coming in from both Gwen Brennan and Stephen Brett as well, um, just in relation to cost. Um, so we have access to our early adopter program can be available for as little as 1750 euros. Um, so that allows uh, up to eight teachers to get access to the platform with 150 students. And we set out that those teachers provide the scaffolding in regards to rolling out the platform to the school wide come September uh, 2021. And when we look to being able to introduce the platform school wide, depending on the number of students within the school, it'll work out between five and six euro. We're working on a model that works best for the schools, essentially. Um, so that's, that's it in essence. And um, we'd, be, we'd be very glad to see how we can involve any of you as part of that early adopter program. Um, just had a good question here from uh, Connor. So he asked about the, the screens that I demoed um, with the sliding scale. Uh, was the teacher rating uh, how the overall class is in the question or was that on an individual student basis? Excellent question, Connor. So in that scenario, it was uh, the students, the group of students that you chose to provide feedback for that particular learning goal. So that could have been a subset of five, 10 or 15 students where you said, based on your review beforehand, you said, okay, these, I know these uh, students definitely need help on the simultaneous equation uh, 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 question two. Um, so based on that, you would have said, okay, did these students struggle and that's why you're providing the feedback for them or, or uh, were they at a higher level? So that's the case of the subset of students you've chosen uh, for that particular learning goal. Hope that clarifies that. Oh yeah, no. Great. yeah. Uh, we had one more as well there, uh, just someone in relation to the plans for CPD, um, which is really good to hear. So um, uh, I'm just trying to turn on video here now for someone else, but that's okay. Um, that, that's something that we're really putting a lot of focus on over the, the coming weeks and months. So we've seen 
Um, it's come up a lot from teachers that, uh, or from uh, principals as well, that the need for this to be formalized in terms of the training uh, for all the work that teachers have put in when it comes to digital learning, these tools. So we would, we're working actively now to, uh, for our feedback framework and, and just, I suppose, delivering feedback online as something that becomes part of CPD so that the teachers investing their time in upskilling themselves and delivering higher quality feedback becomes something that's recognized from a CPD perspective. So we work closely with all of those schools we would strongly um, expect that the early adopter schools would be part of that first rollout of the CPD, so that those are, are our early users as part of the, the CPD training programs. Um, Nothing else on that I can see. I'm still going through. There's a couple of different um, sources of questions here. Um, but please do keep them coming if you have any more. And if uh, Paul or Andy uh, had something that particularly caught your eye and you wanted to run by them, um, do feel free to run that by us as well. Okay. Folks, I think we've gone past our, our, our slot. Um, so uh, again, the team will be, will be following up and, and thanks really for joining. I want to say just really appreciate your time. I know there's a lot of, of uh, things going on at the moment uh, from a, a, a leader perspective in schools. So as, as principals and deputy principals, we really appreciate you making the time to join today. And we hope you found it useful. And uh, we really would look forward to, to speaking with you and your teams over the, the coming weeks and months. Folks, thanks a million for everything. And we look forward to speaking to you.